With that, I'd like to introduce our in-person guests, Troy Markham and Ben Kessler, who will be in conversation with Dr. Maloof this evening. Uh, a resident for 20 plus years, Troy Markham is Bexley City Council President with a Master's of Science in Plant Pathology from, from The Ohio State University and is a science instructor at The Ohio State University and Capital University. Close, Close enough. And he is the library liaison to City Council. That's the most important role that you have, all right? Uh, ben Kessler is mayor of Bexley, a champion of sustainability efforts for our city and a lover of literature with an English degree from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Tonight, we are delighted to have special guest, Dr. Joe Maloof, professor emeritus, I'm sorry, muteris at Salisbury University with us virtually here on screen. As the founder of the Old Growth Forest Network, Maloof works to preserve, protect, and promote the country's few remaining stands of old growth forest. Much of her time is spent lecturing, writing, and supporting local groups and landowners who are trying to protect community forests from development. We also here to celebrate uh, her April 4th book release, that's today, Nature's Temples, A Natural History of Old Growth Forests. We look forward to hearing what she has to say about the condition of our nation's forests, as well as the relevant, uh, the of encouraging the preservation. Uh, Joe Maloof is the author of four books, in addition to Nature's Temples, Treepedia, The Living Forest, Among the Agents, and Teaching the Trees. Uh, please welcome Dr. Joe Maloof. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, and thank you for hosting my book release party. If there's any other authors in the audience, you know how exciting it is when they give you a date when your book is gonna be released and you feel like you wanna celebrate it. So I feel like I'm celebrating with you all tonight. And I, I'm here in Maryland where we had a beautiful day. I wish I could be in Ohio. I was in Ohio last April and I know how lovely it can be there in April in Ohio in your forest with your beautiful wildflowers. So let's get going. We're gonna talk a little bit about my new book and um, about why forests are so important. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. <laughs> First, we have to find my screen. Can you see that? Can you see my screen? Okay, I'll just assume, I can't hear anything, so I'll just assume you can see my screen. Um, this is the cover of the new book that just came out, which I'm very excited about. And the original copy of Nature's Temples, shown there on the right, was um, released in 2016. And it was a hardcover book, and it's no longer in print. It's kind of something of a collector's item. So if you have one of those, you could sell it now. And I wanted this book to stay in print. It was very important to me because of the reason that I wrote it. And I wrote it because I kept hearing foresters say that forests must be managed to be healthy. And so many people believed that if they owned forest land or had forest land, they had to do something to manage it. And I decided to look further at this question, whether forests needed to be managed to be healthy by looking at the science. So I dove into the scientific literature and any scientist that studied anything comparing older forests to managed forests, whether that was birds or salamanders or snails, we'll talk about all those things, what they found. And so the results are in my book, Nature's Temples. Now, one of the um, fallacies in saying that forests need to be managed by humans to be healthy is just looking at this timeline. Forests evolved around 350 million years ago, long before there were humans, long, long before there were humans. 
humans only evolved around 4 million years ago. That's that uh, green line there at the bottom. So we're very recent on the scene. And in fact, we've um, done more harm than good to the forest since we showed up. So this graph, this image shows the forested parts of the earth in color. So wherever you see yellow or green, that part of planet earth is naturally forested. So forest does not grow everywhere. We're very fortunate to be living in a forested part of earth. But the yellow shows where we have cut down those original forests. And forests may have regrown, but there's none of the original or old growth or primary forest. There's many different terms for it. The green shows where there still are original forests left. So you can see up north, the boreal areas, you know, it's hard to get to, the trees are kind of small, so those forests have survived. And then in the tropics, again, just uh, very remote, uh, difficult to get to those forests, but we're doing our best at cutting them too. So we have had a massive effect on the planet's forests so far, and we've reduced forest cover on the planet from 46% to 31%. Now, looking, uh, narrowing down to the United States, you can see our natural forest cover here. The black areas would be where the old growth, or they called it virgin forest back in 1620, in the 1920s, really. Um, these graphs were made in 1925. Um, you can see the original forest cover shown in black. So course, there were native people here then, and they used the forest and they did clear some forest land for their crops and other reasons. I know in Ohio, you also have the, the mound um, peoples, but the majority of the forest would be now what we call old growth forest. But with the European settlers, Cutting happened very, very quickly, and it happened most quickly along the coast where it was easy to transport the wood. A lot of that wood got exported um, back to countries that had already cut their forests down, such as um, the European countries and the island countries. And you can see in the 1850 graph, we hadn't cut much of the West yet, but by the last graph in this series, 1920, then the Western expansion had happened, and then we're cutting down the, the redwoods and the sequoias. And the cutting has continued since 1920, of course, every decade, more forests cut, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and so on. I mean, some of you in your lifetime have probably seen some old growth forests cut down. And now we're at the point where we only have 1% of our original forests left in the East and only 5% left in the West. So if you've been to Muir Woods or to see the Redwoods or Sequoia National Park, sometimes it's easy to think, oh, we saved all that. Well, we've just saved a very small bit of it. We've only saved 2% of the original redwood forests, but they're so remarkable. And same in the East, just 1%. And the forests have grown back, of course, in many places, but instead of looking like the diverse old growth forests in the top left, many of them are kind of depauperate compared to that. Zooming into Ohio, um, Ohio is kind of the same story. This colorful image shows Ohio forest cover in 1600. So before the European settlers arrived, Ohio was 
Boris did. It's hard to believe that right now when we look at it, but it was a beautiful forested landmass. And all these colors represent different forest communities, so different tree species. So the um, light green is oak, sugar maple, dark green is beech, purple is elm ash, swamp forest, and so on. The little bits of yellow up there are the prairie grasslands. Well, just like everywhere else in the country, you know, the European settlers came in and they cut the forest, they exported the forest, they used the forest for everything, ships, houses, railroads, and then burned them if they were just in the way. So by 1940, the Ohio forest cover was down to 15%. And that's this graph that's um, where you see the least green on it here. But there is, you know, this sounds depressing, but there's a little bit of a positive to this story in that forest cover has been increasing since then. And this is the story all over the country, really. Um, we hit the low point right about the turn of the century. So between 1880 and 1920, a lot of barren areas. But then a lot of the areas that were cut were then just abandoned or farm fields were abandoned and a lot of forests did grow back. And these are what we call now our second growth forests. But what is happening now is that these second growth forests that are now maybe 150 years old or 100 years old or 80 years old, depending on what when the original forest was cut, now we're cutting them again. And this is what I wish we would wake up to and, <laughs> and reconsider. And so here I am sitting, this is Maryland with you know, a mixed native forest. This is what came back after the original cut, all kinds of different species. The one on the right is in New Jersey, a wildlife management area. Mostly those are the oaks that are stacked there um, for sale on our public, from our public lands. Okay, so old growth forests. What are old growth forests? If you're not familiar, I'm going to quickly go through some attributes of old growth forests. And I talk about these in my book. One of the problems with old growth forests is, especially in the East, we don't always recognize them because we imagine they're going to look something like a redwood forest where all the trees are huge and you walk in and it's like, ah, oh, you know, you just know it automatically. But they're not really like that. Um, the Eastern old growth forests don't have just all big trees. They have trees of all ages and all sizes. So they'll have some big old trees, but they'll have medium trees and they'll have a lot of young trees. So it doesn't really hit you on the head the way the Western forests do. They're very subtle. Um, other signs to look for is a lot of coarse woody debris or down logs. And this is a positive sign in a native forest. This means trees were able to live long enough to die of old age. And then they're, they're on the forest floor providing nutrients and providing habitat for the next generation of trees. Uh, another indicator is called pit and mound topography. That's basically just the trees that fall over and bring their root ball with them. I'm going to try to go back really quick. Yeah, bring their root ball with them. And then you end up with this pit here of water and then a mound of soil as it falls off the roots. Um, so the wood may decompose, but the soil stays behind. And this is important because it adds topographical variety to the forest floor. And any variety is going to also result in diversity. Um, another thing you'll notice in these old growth forests is fewer invasive species. And I have to tell you the most beautiful wildflower displays that I have seen in the east are in the Ohio forest. You're very fortunate. To me, this is the easiest indicator of old growth forests in the east, and it's this unusual canopy structure. Now, not very impressive, right? It looks kind of like antlers, 
you know, not a lot of branches up there and they're going in all kinds of different directions. Nothing like the trees you drew in third grade. So if you see something really strange and wiggly like this, it tells you that this is a very old tree, even if it's not very wide in diameter. And the reason that the old trees look this way is because they've been standing in one spot for hundreds of years and everything has happened to them. Trees have grown up around them, trees have fallen down and hit them, there's been ice storms, there's been tornadoes, there's been everything you can imagine, and yet still they persist. This is another image of a canopy of a very old tree with those kind of antlery strange branches up there. And look at the bark on this tree. See how um, this is shag bark hickory and they just get shaggier and shaggier and shaggier as they get old. So this is a very old tree. And my hand is on a chestnut oak at Fort Hill, which is um, another beautiful old growth forest in Ohio with wonderful wildflowers. If I were you, I'd be planning a trip to go there in a couple of weeks. And the chestnut oak bark just gets more and more deeply ridged as it gets older. So when you see bark like this, you're like, oh, this is an old tree. Um, also in an old growth forest, you'll find a lot of snags, which are standing dead trees. And the reason that the snags are there is because again, the trees have been allowed to get so old and just stay. So this forest wasn't cut 40 years ago, <laughs> these, um, or they would have knocked down those snags. This, these trees have been here for a long time. And the snags are very, very important for wildlife habitat. Um, all kinds of animals live in these spaces up above the forest floor, away from predators. Um, flying squirrels are one example. But here in this image, we have another example. There's a lot of birds such as swallows that are cavity dwellers, but they don't have the mouth parts like woodpeckers to make their own cavities. So they depend on these natural cavities in the snags. So you'll have higher bird diversity in the forest with the snags. And then when we define old growth and talk about old growth is we have to recognize that Western old growth is very different than Eastern old growth. But these attributes cover both of those. So this tree that I'm hugging here in the East, this is a 350 year old tree, a very, very old tree. Now getting on to the specifics of the things that I talk about in the book. Um, as far as the science studies, what is the difference between a managed forest and an unmanaged forest or an old growth forest as far as birds? Well, the thing with birds is that you will have different bird species depending on the age of the forest. So there are certain bird species that are only gonna be in cleared areas or young forests. <clears throat> There will be other bird species found in recovering middle-aged forests, mature forests, and then certain bird species found in old growth forests. So it's not that there's more in one or more in the other, it's just different species. So in the, um, in the older forests, you'll have uh, more warblers, more hawks, more owls, more swallows, brown creeper is kind of an indicator of the old forest. And um, I just want you to be aware of that these days, there's a big push. A lot of people are saying, oh, we need more early successional habitat because the um, quail and grouse and woodcock like these cleared areas. Um, a couple things there. Yes, that's true. You know, all sorts of habitat are good, but much of this effort is trying to cut the forest to create this early successional habitat. 
And um, I do not believe that that's good. We can have early successional habitat that's naturally formed from storms and ice storms and tornadoes, and those birds will use those areas. So just be aware that that push for early successional areas should not come at the expense of our forests. Another chapter is on salamanders and the older a forest gets, the more salamanders you're gonna find there. Not only the numbers of salamanders, but the different species of salamanders. And there are many insect species that are only found in old growth forests, such as these two. And this little snail, um, this was research that was done by a master's student. And he said, you know, I'm gonna compare the old growth forest with the younger managed forest, and I'm gonna look at the snail diversity. And he found that there was, um, there were some snail species only found in the old growth forest. That means if you clear those forests, you're making those snails locally extinct. Then these other little things here, these strange little UFO looking things, these are coleoid lichens. Now these are pretty much microscopic. You can barely see them with the naked eye. And even though I also studied plant pathology as an undergraduate at Troy, um, and I studied fungi, but I had never even heard of these little things. But there are people that are studying them. And what they find is that in the old growth forest, you may have up to 20 different species of these in the forest. In a second growth forest, between three and 19 species, in a young forest, zero to two. So the old growth unmanaged forests have much more diversity there. And even with the wildflowers, um, those who have studied the wildflowers have found more plant diversity and cover in unlogged forests. And we've never seen full recovery of plant diversity once a forest has been logged. Moss, same thing. Some moss species need unmanaged forests. And this is probably for two reasons. One, some of these species just take a long time to get growing and to get established. And so that forest has to be undisturbed for a long time. Also, they need a, um, a habitat that does not dry out, a substrate that stays damp. And the older trees with the thicker bark, that bark is like a little sponge and it stays damper longer. So those moss species can live there longer. And those who have studied mushroom species, comparing younger forests and older forests, find more species in the older native forests. And we know that a lot of these mushroom species, their hyphae or mycelia are actually interconnected with the tree roots and they're sharing supplies, if you will, the trees are giving them sugar, the mushrooms are giving the trees um, certain micronutrients that the trees are not able to absorb on their own. So it's a real mutuality there. So more trees, species in these older forests, more fungi. And the network of mycelia connected to trees gets more complex as a forest ages. And so much of the atmospheric carbon that goes into the trees by going into the leaves when these trees are photosynthesizing, then goes into the soil, into the mycelial network. So a big part of the carbon in our forest is actually stored in the soil, um, about 45%. So this um, kind of op art <laughs> graph here on the right came from one of um, Suzanne Samard's papers. And many of you, since you love trees, might recognize that name. 
she came out with a book last year called Finding the Mother Tree. And she's an excellent researcher of this, these mycorrhizal networks. And what this graph is showing is that the older trees shown in the dark green are connected by the fungi, which is the black lines, to more species, more other trees than the younger trees are. So we have dark green are the old trees, medium green are the average trees, light green are the young trees. And the oldest trees had the most connection to the other trees. So it's like they really are the mother and helping to feed and support the younger trees in that network. So this tells me that even selective logging is going to have an effect in the forest, right? If you decide, oh, I'm going to, you know, build a cabin and I'm just going to take out the trees that are over a certain size because that's what I need for my cabin. Well, you've really changed the underground ecology of that forest. And um, speaking of carbon, so this was one of the updates in the new book that just came out. So I added a chapter on forest fires. I added a chapter on water and I updated the carbon because we've learned so much more now about carbon storage in forests than we did in 2016. So global forest cover here declining, sadly, even though some forest recovery has happened. The United Nations is monitoring what's happening on a global level. And every five years they come out with a new report and the new report shows that we've lost more forest cover in the previous five years. So we have not stopped, stopped that globally. And then we know also that the carbon dioxide levels have been rising and these two things are related. Mostly the rise is due to fossil fuel combustion, but forests are very important there too. And so when we remove forests, we're removing one of those sponges that could absorb that atmospheric carbon dioxide. This is some research that, um, I think is very important because we tend to say, well, you know, there's forest fires and these trees, these these conflagration, these forest fires, and that's releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And yes, it is. You can see on this graph here where it says fire, how much carbon is being released. So the darker orange it is, the more carbon released. And what about the insect? invasions, the pine beetles out west, oh, they've killed so many trees and those trees are going to rot. And yes, that does cause release in carbon. And windstorms also cause release in carbon. But look what causes the most release in carbon, harvesting that we have control over, that we do. So 85% of the carbon lost from the forest is under our control completely. So to summarize what I just said, the older unmanaged forest, more, 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 more better, better. So that's the situation. Now, what do we do about it? How do we save these old forests? Um, what we came up with, this idea came to me, is we need to save at least one forest in each county, make sure it's protected from logging, and open to the public so people can have a relationship to these forests. And so we can build the next generation of forest preservationists. And we do that by having a volunteer in each county that's looking for the oldest forest in that county that's protected from logging, open to the public, and relatively accessible. Lots of times we find a great forest and it's not protected from logging and need to help see that that's accomplished. And what does that look like in Ohio? Wow, 88 counties. Oh my gosh, Ohio. <laughs> it's a big job. But look at the progress we're making. This is 2021. And the green are the already dedicated forests in the network. The yellow is where we have nominations. And the red stripes is where we have the volunteer helping us. So you can see the, the dedicated forests all had volunteers helping us. 
some volunteers are still looking. And look at this, this is 2022, even more, and 2023, yes. And in Franklin County, it's the Edward S. Thomas Nature Preserve and Sharon Woods are in the old growth forest network. So thank you if our county coordinators in the audience or any people that were part of that, um, big gratitude. And I have to say, um, there's been this race that is so fun and so interesting because Pennsylvania, you know, Penn's Woods, that's interpreted, they wanna be number one. They wanna have the most forests in the network. Right now, they are in the lead. They've been working really hard. They have 26, Ohio has 23, and then so on. But coming up, we are going to add four new forests in Ohio. And that means that Ohio is going to take the lead and Pennsylvania is not going to be happy. I, I, I can't hear you, but I hope you're clapping. <laughs> yeah, it's so exciting. And so if you ever want to be invited to one of these dedications, if you sign up um, oldgrowthforest.net to be on our mailing list, what we do is whenever we have a dedication in your state, we send you an email, the emails just went out, inviting people in Ohio to these dedications. And then the dedications usually involve a beautiful hike through these forests, so they're very fun. So to wrap up, we feel like, and this is at Fort Hill in Ohio, um, it's a network of forests, yes, but it's really a network of people who care about forests. And I know you do too, because you're here tonight. So thank you very much. Um, oh, this, <laughs> sorry, I didn't correct this. We currently have 186 forests in 32 states. <laughs> That's an old slide. So if you want to know where any of the forests are in any of the states, you can go to this uh, link. It says forests, and it'll give you exact directions to all the forests in the network. And I hope you can visit some. And feel free to email me if you had questions. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Joan. Can you hear us? Thank okay. You. All right. Yes. Can mm -hmm. you see us. She can yes. Read. Oh, good. Great. Oh, all right. What's up? I don't know. Where are we looking? Which camera are we looking? Well, I can't Great. see the person all the way, the furthest from the screen. I'm going to move. Should we scooch in? Scooch in a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Good. We love these hybrid, these hybrid meetings. So just so you yep. know, I know you couldn't hear just now, but there's a lot of enthusiasm in the room. Um, I imagine it's probably kind of hard not to get that feedback from the audience, but uh, thank you so much for sharing, sharing your time with us today. And uh, Troy and I have really um, organized exactly how we're going to do this initial Q&A session to a T. Just like every other Just week like at all uh, the city council meetings. So man. Troy, uh, why don't you start us off? Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, um, and, and I do want to take credit, by the way. Good. Because uh, I did tell the mayor, I said, please bring props. And yes. I knew he would not disappoint. Uh, I do I, want to point out that there, so we have a native hardwood products from Bexley. None of these were felled for the process of making them. They were found. And uh, there is a little bit of cherry wood in one of these that came from a tree that had fallen at Jeffrey Woods, but we took just a little slice of it, uh, Dr. Maloub. We left the rest in place uh, to be part of that habitat. So I wanted Great. to point that out. I'm in favor of reclaimed wood. I like wood products. Uh, and also, uh, Susan Quintens is out there with the Tree Commission, and I will say that since I've been on city council, I've had a lot of conversations with the mayor, uh, with the Tree Commission, about saving trees, saving uh, that, that woodland here. I want to say uh, congratulations to Dr. Maloof for the uh, for the the book unveiling today, uh, the new edition out today. Um, yeah, I've. I, and by the way, I, I don't want to brag, but I've had a copy of the book for a couple of weeks before it actually came out. That's the first time that's ever happened to me. So I feel 
super, uh, super privileged and excited about that. Uh, the mayor and I were just saying uh, also special uh, props uh, to you, Dr. Malou, for bringing the presentation with so many photos from Ohio for us, which is, uh, yes. uh, it's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, I did note that uh, uh, today I was taking a look at some of the other books that you've put out. And um, one of them is Among the Ancients, which you mentioned. Uh, you take readers to a forest in each state east of the Mississippi. And so I wasn't able to get a hold of the book in time. So I'm sort of curious uh, where you took them in Ohio. What was the notable forest here in Ohio? Am I putting you on the spot? Do you remember? Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, hold on. I have it right back here. <laughs> we'll come back to that one. Okay. Was it, is it, was it Johnson Woods? Johnson Woods? Do you have? Yes. You have a forest called Johnson Woods, I believe. I, I just thought that was pretty interesting that, you know, and it sounded like a great, great book uh, to pick up as well. And then I also stumbled upon your uh, Find a Network Forest tool uh, there, which I think is also pretty awesome. I would uh, tell people to check it out. It will show you uh, a lot of different forests there in Ohio. I guess uh, as a scientist who now works as an elected official in city government, um, I got to kind of push to one of the main themes that I found very interesting uh, in your book, which was, uh, you know, as scientists, we tend to think, well, we'll inform people and we will find out things and that will help us solve problems. And, and I know that at a certain point in your book, you talked about uh, your frustration, uh, save, trying to save a forest in Maryland for several years, and you're ultimately unsuccessful. And even at the point in the book, you said, not only has it been deforested, but nothing has been built on the site, at least as uh, when the, the publication happened. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that learning process for you and uh, what you have found effective now in actually saving saving the forest? Yeah. Oh, that was a sad story. So it was a 14 acre forest in the heart of Salisbury, Maryland, and it was the last old growth forest inside the city. So I can recognize old growth forest. It was an old growth forest in the city, but it was owned by a developer. And I thought, well, if I went to the, you know, the local homeowners associations, if I went to the mayor, if I went to the city council, if I went to all these people and told them what was going on and how important this forest was, that somehow it would be saved. But what I've learned is that there's no regulations that will stop a forest from being cut just because it's an old growth forest. So the private property rights, and even if they were just gonna log it for the wood, that would be perfectly legal. And at the time, um, well, what I've learned is that what would have worked was money. Instead of telling everybody <laughs> that this is a problem and thinking it would magically stop the development, what I should have been doing is seriously fundraising. And it wasn't that expensive and we could have raised money and there is money out there for things like this. But at the time, I didn't think that was my job. I was a university professor and I didn't have the experience. But now if I had to do it again, I'd be raising money and buying it. That's a poignant point. Absolutely. So Dr. Maloof, I think um, I'm probably joined by other residents here in Bexley when we, when we reading through your book and hearing you talk, uh, and especially just now talking about the 14 acre plot in your town, I think of our, our woods that we have. And um, the largest grouping of woods that we have in Bexley is a, a, a forest called Jeffrey Woods. It was um, lovingly maintained by uh, the the namesake uh, Jeffrey family, um, turned into almost like a mini arboretum. So it's not a 100% native forest, uh, but there are part portions of it that are certainly, um, if they are second forests, they're they've been around for a very long time, maybe 150 years, maybe 100 years. Um, and so I think of. First off, I want to thank you because we are in our community. We're very protective of Jeffrey Woods. It is a sacrosanct piece of 
of property. Um, it's owned by the city already, so we don't have the same kind of developer tension that you're talking about. And I've always, in policy, been very protective of Jeffrey Woods. But um, I, I, finishing your book, I am now an activist. <laughs> so yeah. uh, you've turned me into a zealot. Uh, so watch out. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like yet. Um, but it was, <laughs> I think that, um, and, and, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to be autobiographical here, but I, there was a lot of things that were very relatable in what you wrote. Um, you talked about how the ancient uh, trees in Ohio and states like Ohio were so big compared to what they are today because the ground that was feeding them was the most fertile ground and that's since been taken up with farmland. And as a kid, I had the, uh, the pleasure of being the kid who got to mow uh, our family farm. <laughs> so we had, I probably mowed about 20 acres of grass every summer. Um, and I convinced my dad that like there was about a 10 acre portion of this that we really didn't need to mow, right? We could just let it grow grow and see what happened. And if you've ever stopped mowing uh, grass in a fertile portion of Ohio, you realize that within three years, you have shrubs everywhere. And then right. within five years, you start to have a forest. And it's been 35, 30 years maybe now at this point, and it is a mature, not mature, 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 and hopefully by the time I die, it might even make old growth status based upon your book. Yeah. So I'm super excited about that. I might make it. Um, yeah. All of that to say, I guess as we think about our own woods and, and preserving and, and maintaining and, and seeing them grow and mature into true old growth forests, what would you recommend to communities? Is it just to take a total do nothing approach, just total hands off? Um, what, what can we do to make sure that we're allowing those forests to grow into maturity? Is it you know, I guess I'll leave it there and ask ask that question. Yeah, well, as you saw, you know, the earth knows what it wants to do. It knows what it wants there. In Ohio, the earth wants to grow for us. So I think if we can just get out of the way and let it do that, um, the more we can leave it alone, the better. Now, you know, if there's a lot of invasive species coming in there that are choking the trees or vines, I would be in favor of cutting those off. Like if English ivy came in and was um, affecting the trees, but otherwise just leaving it alone is the best thing to do. And um, I wanted to mention, you know, you were talking about your Jeffrey Woods and it reminded me so many stories all over of individuals that have made a difference. So I just showed you a number of photos from Worcester, and um, that was just a, a high school teacher that saw this beautiful land for sale with forest, bought it, ended up giving it to the city. The city ended up adding on to it. Then they put um, a no log conservation easement on it. And now it's the, it's the gem of the town. So individuals really can make a difference. So there could be people that have forest land that want to donate it to the town if the town cares so much about it. That's yeah. Great. Thank you. And actually you I was gonna ask you about invasive, so I'm glad that you went you went right to it. I appreciate yeah. that. And I will uh, I could also add that just because a forest is owned by the city doesn't mean it's safe forever because as you know, politicians can go. Yep. You could have somebody sitting in that 20 years from now feels like and wants the income. So in Salisbury, again, the city had a forest, an old forest, and um they were the county wanted it because they wanted to make ball fields there. And the city was going to give the forest to the county to be cut down and have ball fields in. But that was the case because it was public land where we could be active and tell the city that we didn't think they should give it away. And not only did we save the forest, but they put a conservation easement on the forest. So it doesn't matter who's in power in the city, that forest can never be cut. Good advice. We've got all these uh, sciencey questions down here, but 
you know, uh, you know, you were mentioning that, and I just wanted to say I, I didn't realize uh, until I was probably a young adult that I had grown up with a different experience than uh, most people, which is uh, I grew up in southern Ohio, and my family lived in a rural area, and we had acres and acres of forest all around uh, our house where we lived. So as a child, I would spend time in the forest, you know, just playing me and my brother and and having that. Uh, and as I grew grew older and I came into urban areas like Columbus, I thought, well, it's sort of strange that we have these parks set aside, but I had taken for granted, you know, that experience of being in the forest and surrounded by it. When I read your book, uh, I got, you know, toward the end, I was really impressed by how you did, you know, you articulate that too, right? There, there is something uh, ethereal or primal about we belong in the forest to some extent, right? There is, there's, a, there's a sort of an emotional thing. There's a, there's a mental health and a, and even a spiritual thing. And I guess I'm going to ask you a very non-science question and just say, can you talk a little bit about that for yourself? Because I think we can feel the passion in you. And I'm just curious, you know, as a young girl or, or what experience you had in your life that, uh, uh, when trees and forests drew you in and, and touched you like that? Thank you for that beautiful question. Um, I feel like I was born with an affinity for plants. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. People who believe in past lives, maybe that was it. But I was always fascinated with plants. And so <clears throat> that's what I studied at the university. And I feel like as I got older, my life went on, the plants just got larger and larger and larger and that I was interested in. And then it went from individual plants to really the whole ecosystem, how everything's connected to each other. And that just brings me great joy to see that the earth can create in such a beautiful way. And so when I walk into an older forest, especially, it just makes me feel so good. And I don't know really why that is. Is it something in the air? The leaves are giving out compounds or is it just the shapes or the sounds of the wind? Or is it because of what we've come from? We look around and see this is the health of the planet. And so we feel good and 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 as a part of that. So there's a lot of mysteries there, but we are learning recently that there are absolute health benefits that our blood pressure goes down when we walk through a forest, our stress hormone levels go down, our immune cells are increased. This is all new information in the last 40 years. So the forest we can be happy and feel good, but they actually are healing us as well. So kind of to piggyback off of that and talking about um, the magic of the forests, uh, what I what I found really enthralling about your book is how you got me excited about snails and <laughs> and worms and and insects in the forest. And, and there was a, a quote in your book um, you said, as you walk through a forest, everything you see, saw, heard, and even smelled was largely largely the result of insects. Not just talking about pollinators. Before human intervention, old growth forests depended on leaf-eating insects. Tree leaves smell different because of specialized anti-insect chemistry. And so just imagining that, you know, that smell that you're talking about, whatever that is, we're just like breathing in insects, <laughs> is kind of gross, but also really cool. Um, and along the insect and, and small uh, small little creature um, um, lines, what I found really, really interesting was how you talked about forests that have are in geographical areas that had been covered by glaciers. And what a difference uh, the presence of glaciers so many, so many, many, many years ago make still to this day. Do you want to talk just a little bit about the, the post-glacial forests in America? Well, um, yeah, so we, we 
look at the globe and you know I show images like here's where the forest is and here's where it isn't but we have to keep in mind that our we're on a changeable planet right the continents are even moving around and the climate's moving around even before humans started um, burning fossil fuels and so because of that the forests have also been moving around and changing around so um with it and we have to thank people that study the the pollen the ancient pollen records to tell us these stories but when the glaciers came down from the north this last time anyway that's the time i'm most familiar with um where i am now instead of having deciduous trees like beech trees and maple trees and oak trees a lot like the ohio forest it would have been sand dunes and conifers because the glaciers didn't cover here but it was very cold and those broadleaf trees wouldn't survive but then when the glaciers receded then those broadleaf temperate trees that survived in these little cove areas down in the the smoky mountains and down in tennessee where somehow they were protected from the the colder climate could then start spreading back northward again so now we do have all those species and now with the warming they're going even further north but the worm story is that when the glaciers came down and covered the soil for so many years they killed any worms that native worms that lived in that soil now the glaciers have receded but the native worms haven't come back in those places where the glaciers once were the native worms still live where the glaciers didn't cover but they don't live where the glaciers did cover and they'll probably migrate too just like the trees are but it's happening so slowly it's not obvious to us that you know there's still like this real kind of stark difference in biodiversity in the post-glacial areas um you talk about salamanders and some other just like markers of where where a glacier had once been and that that still is is present to this day is really really fascinating yeah 13,000 you, you should tell the story of your uh worm project as a as a child, I think <laughs> that was kind of illuminating for me. It's funny because we have an environmental organization here, um, Assateague Coastal Trust, and they're having a speaker come in that's going to talk about um, verma composting, uh, using worms for composting. And I said, well, whatever you do, tell them not, not to tell people to just dump them into their compost pile when they're done, because um, that's exactly what I did many decades ago. I had this worm composting project and oh, it wasn't working. It would smell. I was just like, oh, I'll dump it in the compost pile, right? The worms are good for compost. Well, you know, decades go by, PhD, I've learned a lot more and I've just released a bunch of non-native worms into the ecosystem that there's no way to get out. And they, they, have been released in the forest mainly by fishermen releasing their bait and they have had a negative influence in our forest mainly because they eat the leaf litter and that leaf litter is needed as um well a compost to enrich the soil but also as a place for native plants to germinate and grow so if you get rid of that leaf litter you were negatively affecting the wildflowers in the area. Eric Kessler and I are sometimes on the wavelength here together. And I just want you to, I want to, as a side note, I only have one quote from the book written in my notes. And that is the, uh, everything you see here and smell is the, oh, the insects. insects on <laughs> as well. Yeah. It's a yeah. <laughs> Think of the conifers, spruce tree and the firs and how good they smell. And that's because they have, they keep their needles for years. They're on there. And so those are just out there for insects to eat unless they have this chemical defense. You know, they can't brush off the insects. 
they can't shrug them up. They can't do anything. All they can do is produce chemicals to hope the insects won't like the way they taste. But then that results in them smelling so good to us. So there's a, uh, uh, for, for the age of, there's a chapter about the oldest tree and, and an incredibly sad story about the oldest known tree that was cut down when a, a core got stuck and a ranger had cut down the tree. Um, oh. What also I think was fascinating to me was the spread in sort of maximum age between the bald cypress and the tulip poplar. So here we have a bald cypress, 2,624 years recorded. The next second one after that, I might be wrong about that because I pulled this out of the book and I might not have taken it into context, but there's still like a huge spread between oldest and, and what, next old. What, 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 do you, what do you attribute that to? What is, what's- what, Yeah, what is so, um, so thank you to the people that um, are keeping these records um, and they're updated all the time and they're fascinating. Um, looking, this is on page 17 in the book. Um, well, the bald cypress tree that is 2,600 years old, um, I got to visit it last year. It's in North Carolina. And it's not just like one tree that people have been taking care of. It's in an ecosystem, in a swamp ecosystem. You have to I kayaked for hours to get to it. And it's not a special tree in that habitat. There are many amazing old gnarly bald cypress trees in that area. And previously to the coring and aging of that tree, we thought maybe the bald cypress tree could live to be 600 years old. But then in this one place near the Fear River in North Carolina, we found this habitat with all of them that were ancient. They just blew these statistics out of the water. Um, the bald cypress are an older tree than the, I would say older, well, no, I can't, they're not older evolutionarily. They, um, why did they live so long in that place? I don't know. I think we, you know, we were talking about the changes and it's a place that didn't get glaciated, which would have killed them. And it didn't go through any drought cycles probably because it's in this swampy area. It just got lucky. It's amazing. And to imagine that um, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, heck, we, well, maybe, Maybe they were found about 20 years ago. So 50 years ago, we had no idea that there were any bald cypress trees that old on the planet. So right now, the oldest trees on the planet are the bristlecone pine that you mentioned. And they, the oldest of those trees, they're 4,000 years old. So, yeah. And uh, to correct what I was, it was actually the maximum age of trees in the Eastern United States in that table. And I had just called off the tulip poplar because I know that we have tulip poplars at Bexley. <laughs> That's a little <laughs> further down the line. <laughs> but still, the spread is pretty remarkable. And tulip poplars can be very old. You know, they can get they can get to be 500 years old. The interesting thing about tulip poplars is they grow really fast. So you can look at an 80 year old one and think, oh, it's really ancient, but it's really not that ancient. And then you can look at a 400 year old one. It won't look that much larger, but the bark and that um, crown structure will tell you how old it is. Your book, I think you actually mentioned a, a 170 foot high tulip poplar somewhere in Ohio. So we'll be, Troy and I are gonna figure out where that's at. Don't tell us, field trip. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so as a plant pathologist, I'm gonna, you know, you won't be surprised to find out how much I love fungi. And uh, I, I just think fungi are sort of particularly interesting in terms of forests because we don't really know how a lot of fungi live. We don't really even know how to identify them. They're difficult to cultivate. Anybody that loves a morel mushroom knows that you have to go out and find the morel mushrooms, you know. Um, I'm going to give you a two-part question, and I'm going to encourage you to just be just wild and crazy with your answer here. 
like what what kind of things do you think we might be uh, missing uh, by not having a lot of old growth forests in terms of fungi providing uh, food, medicines, that sort of thing. And maybe even more interesting, uh, the partnership that fungi uh, forms with the trees and those mycorrhizal networks beneath the ground where they connect all those trees. What kind of communication, how extensive might that communication be? And, and what, what sort of uh, future would there be with that in terms of if we were to, to increase and, and keep these forests and those uh, networks, those relationships going? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, it, first of all, it's amazing to me how little we know about this. When I was doing the research, research for my book, I really only found two good references for people that had actually studied over a number of years, all the mushroom species or fungal species in one forest. And um, they were mainly not your mainstream scientists. You know, one was a you know, master's degree student and another was almost a hobbyist. And it amazed me how many different species they found, like, you know, 168 different species in one forest and 200. It's hard for me to even imagine being able to identify that many different fungal species. So how we could even imagine the things that they're doing and the compounds they're sharing with each other um, I know you asked me to be wild and crazy, but <laughs> I can't, I think we just have so much more to learn, but I do want to um, point out the beauty of the forest. This is something that only after I started visiting all these old growth forests really hit home for me. These older forests are so much more beautiful than the younger forests. And the fungi are part of that. You know, walking along and seeing this green mushroom or this red mushroom or this big lion's mane mushroom, um, it just adds to the, yeah, the biodiversity and the beauty of the forest. I have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> By the way, um, there is a, in case you haven't, this hasn't come on your radar, there's a, a newly popular TV series on HBO called wow. The Last of Us, which is sort of a dystopian take on fungus. So okay. just so you know, you might get questions in the future about fungus and The Last of Us. I, I really wasn't encouraging <laughs> her to go in that direction. I'm just, I'm just uh, <laughs> giving her a heads up. This is day one of the re-release of the book, so. Thanks, I'll have to do my homework. <laughs> um, I, and I don't I want to make sure with the time check, we open this up for questions from our audience and, and that we don't totally uh, uh, take this over. But I do want to point out, first off, the work that you've done with the Old Growth Network is so amazing. So just want to applaud you and all the people involved in that. Let's leave yeah. that. Um, We have, you, you mentioned in Franklin County, also Licking County, the Flint Ridge uh, Ancient Quarries and Nature Preserve is uh, registered in Fairfield County, also adjacent to us, Black Hook Woods, and in Delaware County to Edward F. Hutchins Nature Preserve at High Banks. So we are surrounded by counties that have these old growth forests. What can we do as citizens to help um, identify those forests of the counties in Ohio that haven't yet uh, had designation? Um, well, on our website, it'll tell you if there's a county coordinator, which is what we call our volunteer for a county signed up. And if you see that, oh, there's a county I go to frequently or live in and um, they don't have a county coordinator, I might be interested in that then you could just, there's a form you can fill out and then we will tell you exactly what the next steps are. You know, And part of that is how to recognize these old forests like I just went through briefly, how to, um, and we'll give you also if we have nominations 
from other people that have recommended for us. So it would be wonderful to volunteer to be a county coordinator, but also just um, looking around where you live and asking questions about what is the oldest forest in your community that you can see where you live and who owns that forest? These are important questions because then they lead to what's gonna happen to that forest. Because if we don't ask these questions, you can come around the corner one day and that forest can be down. I also want to uh, give a shout out to the Ohio Natural Areas Program. I get, you know, I work in all across the country, so I get to see what's happening in different states. And in Ohio, particularly the Natural Areas Program is being proactive and looking for these last special forests that are left maybe part of the family farm, maybe the woodlot. And they wanna make sure when that property changes hands that it's protected and goes becomes public land. I think we have some questions from online and then we'll open it up to the floor. Sure. Uh, Carol um, asks, uh, does Bexley have a plan to stop calorie trees? I, I don't know if I pronounced that right. C-A-L-L-E-R-Y trees from taking over Jeffrey Woods like they have all around I-71 and I-270. Uh, North Carolina has or had a bounty where they offer native tree replacement if they take out their calorie trees. All right. Well, Bexley is is blessed with an incredibly uh, strong and proactive tree commission. If you're not aware, basically the tree commission runs the city of Bexley. Uh, uh, I say this half jokingly. Uh, no. Um, so I think that one of the things that um, our tree commission and, and, and Troy is a, as a council member has been active in identifying invasive species and how we handle this. So we've been pretty proactive about um, in general um, making sure that we're aware of the invasive species that are active in our communities and that we are uh, proactively tackling them. Um, I don't know if, if our chair wants to add anything specific to the pear trees. Oh, um, my colleague, Mary, my mother's here as well. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, you, you can't hear me. So um, pear trees are prohibited from being sold in nurseries now. They were on a, I think, an Alistair, you can jump in here too. They were on a five-year watch and now they've been eliminated from being sold and they're an invasive species in Bexley. So we don't plant them. Now, whether people choose to buy them in Maryland and bring them, I don't know. Dr. Maloof, if they're available in other states. Um, yeah. yeah, but um, we, we have seen that program where people can take down an invasive species from their yard and bring it in and have a, a, tree, a different tree given to them. And that's something that Mary and I have talked about for a tree giveaway for next year. Great. And, and by the way, we are, we are really blessed here in Bexley, not to only be surrounded by trees, but to have this group of people in the tree commission that we were constantly looking at things like that. We're looking at information. We're looking at native species versus invasive species. And, and so this is something that we think about and we're acting on all the time. Great, sounds very progressive. Any other questions? Thank you. Hi, I um, I had a question for you. Um, I spent about 13 years in California, and I know that there was a lot of talk there about controlled burns in the forest to manage droughts. And um, you had a brief slide that was talking about forest fires and things like that. So I would love to kind of hear your thoughts on, you know, natural fires that are caused by lightning strikes versus some of the controlled burns that people say are necessary in order to kind of prevent some of the devastation that um, California has seen in the most recent years? Um, thank you for that question. It's very complex. We're still learning about this, but I'll share my position right now, what I'm learning. Um, there is the big push, as you say, to thin these, thin, these are Western forests now, thinning, which is done with heavy equipment. It's not just one tree at a time with a chainsaw 
um, massive thinning of forests, and then prescribed burning of the forests. And it's claimed that this will slow down the forest fires and prevent fires in communities. And the Forest Service really believes this. What I've read, I really do not believe this. I've seen some of these forests that have had this treatment and you might have some standing trees that will survive a fire, but the ecosystem is not intact anymore. And in fact, it's drier and the winds can get through there faster. So there's a researcher named Chad Hansen, and he wrote a book called Smoke Screen. And according to his research, the fires can actually spread faster through these thinned places, even if they've been prescribed burns. What I'm seeing is that the most wild forests, and um, these are measured in something called gap, <laughs> gap numbers, but the most wild forests are actually the ones that are the most resistant. So it's not the thinned and burned that are the most resistant. It's the most wild where they're damper. And yes, yeah, sometimes they burn too when the fires get hot enough. But overall, the numbers are saying that the mature left alone forests do better. And it's really interesting now how it's, you know, there's a lot of emotion there. And it, like the, the, the forest industry is on the side of the thinning and burning and they get a lot of government money for that. And it also produces income from the timber that they take out. But the ecologists like myself, looking at the data are falling on the other side. Big piggyback off of that. You said it really beautifully in the book. You said, if you think forests dependent on humans to manage them and keep them healthy, Bear in mind that forests have been on Earth taking care of themselves since long before humans existed. And so you recommend a little humility. I think I like the way you say that. <laughs> Any additional questions? So many of the um, brilliant tree writers these days are women, Suzanne Chamard, you mentioned, and also Diane Beresford Kroger, I've read, and I'll be reading you. Um, do you think there's something to that, just noticing the women and, and are the men listening to you guys? Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> wow, well, that's great. And also, you know, our first employees at the Old Growth Forest Network were women too. So we just happened that way, but we really felt like there was this force for the forest. Um, <clears throat> maybe it's because, maybe it has to do historically with how um, our history of the men getting the job and going to work and the women staying in the home, at least in America, you know, in the 50s when I was born. And, and so the men that were really interested in forests studied forestry, and it was very male-dominated culture, and it still is. And they've come up with, you know, oh, here's how we can get the cut out, and here's how we can get more wood to grow, and, and it's been a very, very aggressive industry toward our forests, even though as individuals, they love forests, that's how they got into it, but then they just get trained in this aggressive management. And I think maybe now that women are more in the workforce and have seen what that industrial management has done, that has brought out these alternative voices. Um, none, so, um, are they listening? <laughs> That's why I started writing my very first book, Teaching the Trees, because I had these forester friends and I was trying to get them to understand this fuller ecology. And I thought, well, they won't stand there and listen to me say it. So maybe if I write it down, they'll read it on their own and maybe they'll understand it. Uh, there's still a struggle out there, I have to say. Um, between like right now our state forest management, they're just 
cutting and thinning and keeping the forest young. Um, but we are going to send a copy. We got a grant to send a copy of this new book just released today, Nature's Temples, to each of the 50 forestry schools in the country. And we're going to send it to the ecologist on the staff. And we're hoping that eventually there'll be changes in the forestry schools. Dr. Dr. Maloof, are we are we up, up, up on time page? Is there one 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 more question from? Okay. Well, I want to first off, um, I do want to thank. Uh, I don't I don't know if any of you know Larry Hellman with Bexley Historical Society and the Tree Commission and ARB and the Land Use Strategy Commission and many other things. Uh, but Larry Hellman uh, gave me a little bit of a primer on the Jeffrey Woods history. Uh, just to kind of refresh my memory coming in today. So he also recommends that we check out the Bexley Historical Society website and check out the tidbits section where you can learn some more about the history of our trees and preservation in Bexley. I want to thank Gramercy Books for being our lovely neighborhood bookseller and being here this evening. Yeah. Telling Dr. Malou. Hot off the press, new book today. And uh, all the all the Maloof T-shirts over there. Just kidding. We don't have Maloof T-shirts, but we should. We 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 need to get on that. We're gonna work on that. That's 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 next time. Uh, Troy, did you have any uh, any closing thoughts? No, I just really appreciate everybody coming out, and I really appreciate uh, appreciate you coming here with us tonight and uh, and sharing all these great stories and uh, really making this what a fantastic uh, Arbor day arbor month uh treat for us here in bexley so we really appreciate it we love our trees and we loved having you here with us this evening and thank you to the bexley public library for hosting and yeah you all... thank you what a wonderful tree community and great thank you to the tech support people you're brilliant thank you <laughs> thank you so much have a great evening <laughs>